I forgot the <laughs> earphones. <laughs> problem fixed now. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That was a, really a minimal problem. Thank you for yes. this introduction, Stefano. That was yes. perfect. Okay. So uh, I apologize. As you noticed, I had, don't have an excellent connection apparently. So I stopped my video, which was, was freezing anyway. So I will just share my screen. I apologize for that. It's uh, working from home. So, yeah. So I think you should be seeing my screen now. Uh, Stefano, please raise your hand or let me know if not. Yeah, it's fine. It's perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So good morning. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Stefano and, and Claudio and Sergei for putting together this, uh, this school. Um, so we'll be talking about the effective low dimensional dynamics of a network of slow fast spiking lasers. That's something that uh, I'm working on with uh, different people, two students, uh, former students, uh, took part to that, Axel Dolce Mascolo and Alexandre Miazek. And there is a collaboration with different people in, uh, in Maastricht, in uh, Nice, uh, and in Italy about the topic. So I, I, start, I start with, uh, of course, uh, situating our, uh, our approach in, in this machine learning photonics context. Uh, as we have seen so far, there are many ways to look at that, at machine learning photonics. Um, one is artificial neural networks. And I will just use the classification that was uh, pro proposed by, by Demetris uh, one hour ago. Um, at least two ways. One is a compound approach where you use on the one side complex photonics and on, a, on another side computer neural networks to, to do another part of the work. Uh, and the other part is where the photonics try to implement the neural networks. And so I will be about this category today, the other category that will be for Friday. And inside this uh, second uh, category where you try to implement a neural network with photonics, there are uh, at least two approaches, probably even more. So uh, for instance, we can wonder if photonics can mimic computer neural networks. So that is, for instance, the approach that was developed by Demetris in, in, in the first part of his talk, of his previous talk. Uh, a work uh, that I was not aware of that is absolutely fascinating where they can really reproduce in, in optics, in photonics, uh, a well-known um, computer neural network model. So it's, it's, of course, a very nice and fruitful approach. Here we try to do something differently where we try to mimic the dynamics of biological neural networks. And uh, the reason is twofold for that. Uh, one is that um, first, you know, computer neural networks have departed very soon from their original inspiration, which was actually biological neural networks. They have departed from there and they have become a, a whole field of research uh, aiming at some kind of efficiency and trying to understand how these uh, computer neural networks work and so on. But they have kind of uh, abandoned the idea of being tools to, to learn about biology. So, uh, so that's one thing we can try to get perhaps closer again to what uh, is done by biological systems. And, uh, and also because we, when we work on photonic uh, neural networks like this, we may also perhaps provide some, uh, some insight about uh, some better understanding of the collective dynamics of, of neural networks. And perhaps it will also bring uh, some kind of photonic artificial intelligence, but it's not the only objective. So today, what we will try to do is to mimic the dynamics of biological neural networks. And from that, we draw, of course, inspiration from the very best learning machine. Uh, I don't enter into details because the view I will present is very, very simplified. It's about a few key properties. Uh, first is the notion of spikes. So we know that neurons process information, whatever that means, via spikes. So it's not analog, it's not digital, and it is spikes. And there are actually very clear mechanisms, dynamical mechanisms by which these spikes uh, emerge. So we'll discuss that. Then it's about coupling. Even less sophisticated animals have many, many neurons. So if you have just one neuron, it's hard to, to do anything. You can, you can couple it to itself and do some stuff. Uh, for example, memories, we have been working on that in the past, but that's, that's kind of it. And then, uh, the last point is collective dynamics. So it's very well known that large scale waves, which are dynamically low dimensional objects, propagate in response to stimuli in this very best learning machine. So this is the three key properties that we would like to try to, to, to have. 
And uh, about this last point, the low-dimensional mean field dynamics of neurons, it's actually something that is uh, so very important in neurosciences. For instance, it's, it, there is very strong debate about the question of synchronization and desynchronization in epilepsy. And so it's a topic which is addressed, of course, in, by biologists uh, with the tools they have, which are very hard to handle. Uh, and it's, of course, then very much analyzed by uh, theoretical uh, neuroscientists. So, for instance, uh, you have this paper by Ott and Anton Sen in Chaos in 2008, which is a very, very seminal paper, where they demonstrate that they can derive uh, an exact closed form solution for the Kuramoto problem, where all oscillators do not share one frequency, but have a distribution of frequencies. Uh, and in particular, this low dimensional behavior, they can analyze this low dimensional behavior, including the case of some uh, model of neurons. And this was, this is very, a very, very uh, used paper in many contexts. So here people study collective chaos, which is shown to emerge uh, with a population of uh, spiking neurons. So there is a lot of interest and all these papers also have their, their interest. It's, all this is theoretical mathematical neuroscience. So there is a lot of interest in understanding how uh, the low dimensional uh, behavior of the mean field of an ensemble of neurons can emerge. But of course, in biology, it's very hard to control the systems. So Lorenzo this morning, for example, highlighted how hard it is to, to grow neurons and how, <laughs> how long it is in time and so on. So, so uh, our, our goal here is to study a large network of spiking elements in experimental photonics. We would like to provide experiments which kind of mimic the dynamics of uh, biological neural networks, but faster, easier to handle and stuff like that. So that brings us to the first uh, dynamical point we want to emulate, which is about spiking. So spiking is about neural excitability. And here we will discuss the specific case of so-called slow fast systems. It's known that uh, neurons respond to external perturbation in an all or nothing way. For example, in the Hodgkin and Huxley model, this paper in 1952 was the one that it's about modeling of neurons. And it's the one that, um, that yeah, bring, brought the, 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 uh, the Nobel Prize to Hodgkin and Huxley. And uh, this is a picture of their uh, model simulations. So you have a, a system which is uh, in a rest state, and when it is perturbed, uh, slow perturbation, small perturbation, sorry, it will just relax back in the course of time. For larger perturbation, it also relaxes. It takes a longer time, but that is it. And when the perturbation overcomes a certain threshold, then you have this action potential, which is emitted. Uh, so it's a very large deterministic excursion, which is essentially independent of the perturbation. You see that for very large perturbation, the response is always the same. It just comes earlier in time. So actually, the threshold which separates the two, uh, the zero uh, response and the one response is not perfectly defined mathematically in slow fast systems. It is more a canard trajectory that we will uh, discuss in a minute, but still, it very much, it, there is very much a difference between the two kinds of responses. So we can, uh, what are the dynamical ingredients that we need for to have a, a neuron of this kind? Um, the simplest uh, model is, was proposed by uh, Fitzhugh and, and Nagumo independently. So Fitzhugh was doing bio, biophysics and he wanted to provide a simple, simple description of the hodgkin Huxley neuron. So he put together minimal ingredients you need. And Nagumo, on his hand, was doing a, a, an, electrical, an electronic model, an electrical model of uh, impulse propagation in nerves, and he came up with the same system of equations. It's very related to the Van der Poel model, and it's a slow, fast system where this x variable is fast, y is slow due to the presence of this epsilon term, which is much smaller than one. And so we can study this uh, system, or at least the, the, you know, the big ideas of this system very easily, uh, thanks to the geometric singular perturbation theory. That's uh, complicated maths, so we will not do, uh, go into any details, but we just pull what is needed. So uh, what you do to study, what you can do to study a system of this kind is to set epsilon to zero. And then the critical manifold is the stationary of the fast equation. It's the stationary states of the fast system here. 
So what that means is that all trajectories converge very fast towards the, this uh, critical manifold, which is this cubic curve here, wherever it is stable. So it's easy to compute the stability, the cubic here is here in this equation, and it's easy to compute its stability. And here, this is an attractive branch. This one is an attractive branch, and this one is repulsive. So that means that when setting epsilon to zero, all dynamics is on the horizontal line. And wherever you start from, you will end up here, uh, attractive branch, or if you start close to here, you will be pushed there or pushed there on the other attractive branch. This one is repulsive because it's unstable. And then the slow dynamics is defined by a dyna dynamical system along the critical manifold. So that means that when you let the system evolve on the slow scale, it will be driven by the dynamics of the slow equation along the branches, the stable branch of the critical manifold. So what that gives here, in the case of this uh, model of a neuron, is that if you are in a rest state, which is this point here, the intersection of the cubic curve and the linear curve, which are the two null clients of this system, then a small perturbation will just take you back to where you started from. But if the perturbation is large enough that you go beyond this unstable branch of the critical manifold, then the neuron will be pushed here, that is, emit an action potential, slowly drift on this critical manifold and jump down, drop down again, and slowly drift back towards its rest initial point. And this is what happens here. So here, when there is this long time, you are the system actually stays for a long time on the critical manifold. It can, it can do that. That is a canard. And finally, it's ejected, expelled toward the other branch of the critical manifold, and then drifts back, jumps back, and drifts back to its original state. So you have here the three ingredients, a rest state, a separatrix, which is here the canard uh, trajectory along the unstable part of the critical manifold, and the reinjection mechanism. There is a deterministic trajectory that brings you back here. So this is the kind of neuron we would like to study in, uh, in photonics. What we work with are semiconductor lasers. So I, I do a very short introduction of, of a model of semiconductor laser, a basic one, so that, um, yeah, so that you have, um, we have an idea of, of how non-neuron it is. So you can model that with an, a rate equations for uh, laser intensity, laser light intensity, which is driven by losses and gain via interaction with an atomic population. And the atomic population, which evolves over slower time scale, tends to relax to zero, and is but is pumped by an internal energy in an external energy input, and tends to be depleted by the amplification of light. So what this uh, model gives is that below laser threshold you have just one stable node, and above threshold you have one stable focus, which is the laser on system will arrive here and one saddle point which is here so that does not give a, a, an excitable system a neuron at all so there are many ways in which we can bring a laser to behave like a neuron dynamically in a dynamical sense um, one is optical injection delayed optical feedback in some specific regimes polarization dynamics lateral absorption uh, all these uh, can work uh, the specific kind of excitability we're interested in, slow, fast excitability, can be achieved via thermal effects. This is something we've been studied many years ago and which is uh, still, still quite interesting with an innovative uh, view. Um, but we wanted to have something more controllable, controllable than thermal effect that you don't control very much. So what we choose is this approach which is uh, due to uh, Al Naimi and co-workers in 2009, which is a nonlinear optoelectronic feedback. So the principle is that you take a semiconductor laser and the light which is emitted goes to a detector where it is converted into a voltage. It then undergoes a nonlinear transformation uh, that is a high pass filter. So we remove the continuous component and we take a saturable function here and this uh, voltage after this nonlinear loop will be reinjected back into the control parameter here. So this is their ID, and they claim, and it's correct, that you can observe chaotic spiking in this uh, system. This is how it looks like. <clears throat> in terms of modeling, we start from the uh, equations we had before, and we add a new equation, which is much slower variable, 
uh, which is which tends to relax to zero. That will give us uh, uh, high pass filtering. So if 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 nothing pushes this equation away from where it is, it will relax back to zero. And what what pushes it away is a nonlinear saturable function of the laser intensity. And this uh, additional current is applied to uh, the carrier's uh, dynamics, just like a sum summation of this uh, with the with the current. So what it gives is that we have three time scales, and this one is much slower. So it's again a slow fast system that can be studied as we did before. It has this time a two branches critical manifold. One is a laser off state, and it is this straight line. It is stable where it is continuous and becomes unstable here where it's dashed. And the other part of the critical manifold is this parabola, which lies in a plane which is not the x equals zero plane. And this part is stable, so it's attractive for the dynamics, for the fast dynamics. And this part is repulsive for the fast dynamics. So since it's a slow fast system, most of the dynamics will take place by uh, slowly moving along the branches, the attractive branches of critical manifold, and jumps between the two branches. And here we see that when the system departs from the stable, uh, from the unstable branch here, it is pushed away very far by this uh, unstable part, and it will <coughs> actually shrink uh, by doing these helicoids. So these are the laser relaxation oscillations, which are very known, of course, to all laser physicists. And these laser relaxations uh, is what will bring us to relax on the uh, attractive part of the critical manifold. So what that means is that we have a kind of relaxation oscillator as before. By relaxation oscillations, we, we understand the fast jumps between the two attractive branches of the critical manifold. But there is more than that uh, due to this third variable. So there can be chaos uh, which can emerge this in mi mixed mode oscillations, as we shall see. So in an experiment, what we do to check that we have a neuron is that we place the system before a bifurcation limit leading to this limit cycle has taken place. So the system is stable somewhere there and we will apply perturbation to it. So here we have perturbations of growing uh, intensity and we look at the response of the system uh, in the course of time. So when the perturbation is small, not much happens. From time to time, we see a big response, but most of the times we see basically no response, a tiny linear response by which the system comes back to where it was. And when the perturbations become larger, large enough, then you see that you have much more of these uh, nonlinear response. So this is the action potential of our neuron. And when the perturbation is large enough, 25 and even more 27, then all the excitations lead to a response like this. And the jitter in time is also more or less completely suppressed. So one interesting thing we can look at here is the existence of this critical manifold, this scanner orbit that I was mentioning. Here we, uh, we are in the regime where most of attempts, so half of the attempts work and half of the attempts do not work. So those di this, that will work will go and give an action potential. The other ones will just relax directly. And you see that for some cases, we, try, we can stay a little bit longer on the uh, unstable branch and this is a canar orbit, but we will fall back on one state or jump back, jump up to the uh, action potential state. So you really have to work very, very hard to find the example in which you, you follow this trajectory longer. And so finally, what happens is that the excitability threshold is pretty well defined. The separatrix is pretty well defined. This can be summarized uh, here on this graph. Here we have a superposition of all the attempts. We see that all the res responses are the same. They just take place at slightly different times. And we have uh, here, uh, depending on the perturbation power, we see that uh, after some time after the perturbation, we choose the, uh, to look at the intensity sometime after the perturbation, um, that is around here, we look what is the intensity which is emitted. So for the perturbation is small, most of the times we are in the zero state and sometimes we are in the high state. When the perturbation is large, it's the opposite. We are in the high state and most of the time not in the low state. But we are basically never in these intermediate states which 
uh, highlights the existence of the separatrix in phase space. And you see here uh, an excitability threshold, which looks very much like what you find in uh, biology uh, books when you look at the response of a neuron to perturbation. Small perturbations elicit no response. Large perturbations elicit a response every time, 100%. So we have now a neuron-like slow fast system. To be completed, we look at the whole dynamics of the system depending on the control parameter. We see that we are first on a fixed point, then there is random or chaotic spiking. So the model uh, indicates that there should be chaotic spiking in there, but there is also noise. So perhaps noise is inducing actually these spikes, we don't know. Then these spikes become much more frequent and we end up in a relaxation oscillation regime. So a periodic, uh, it's kind of a periodic pulsing, very. Uh, and the periodicity of this pulse breaks up. We have gaps in here until we reach a new stationary state. So this is the bifurcation diagram we have. Fixed point, mixed mode oscillations and from time to time spikes and chaos. And then the relaxation oscillations here and we end up in a new fixed point. Now the question is what happens if we try to make a network of these uh, because one single neuron does not uh, do much. So uh, it's, not, it's not that easy. And it was very well uh, illustrated by, by Demetris in his talk that you need to have kind of large, large networks if you want to do something. So we took a large-ish network, uh, which is commercially available. It's possible to do much more if you control the technology. We don't, so we have to rely on, on commercial uh, devices. So it's an array of lasers, which features 450 uh, lasers. All of them has a slightly different threshold current. This is the threshold characteristic of these lasers. There is a distribution for the threshold current. So all our uh, devices are a little bit different. This uh, highlights there. This is a statistical distribution of our uh, sample. And they are in principle not much coupled by nearest neighbor coupling. Here the picture shows like they are very much touching each other, but I think it's I think it's because we are not perfectly in the in the best uh, imaging plane, uh, and the, let's say the nearest neighbor coupling is supposed to be small or zero, because there is also a very big dispersion in frequency, so they cannot interact coherently. There may be thermal phenomena uh, coupling them that we don't model that may happen, but in principle they have no uh, nearest neighbor coupling. The way we couple them is actually in the feedback loop that makes them chaotic and spiking. So we take the very same setup as before, but we replace our single device by a laser array and we put an iris in front of it, which we can open or close. And all the light that is getting through this iris will go to the detector, undergo the same nonlinear transformation as before and be re-injected in the single power supply that is driving everyone here. So what we have is if we close completely the iris, we have one single device which is driving the dynamics of everyone. If we open it slightly, then we have a small group which is driving the dynamics of everyone. And if we move the iris around, it's different populations that will drive the whole population. And if we open it completely, then it's the simplest case of all, perhaps. It is the so-called fully connected network because all lasers are driving the dynamics of all lasers approximately with the same weight. So what happens when we go from single device to a large network is here. Here we have closed the iris around this single guy and the dynamics is observed here. So it's in this case randomly spiking at the upper state. And if we open the iris uh, over this huge population, about 200, we see a dynamics which seems very much like uh, this one. So it's not for the same current value, but we find it, we observe it. So we look at more examples. Now we look at the mean field. So that is all lasers are coupled to all lasers. And we look at the collective dynamics. And what we see is mixed mode oscillations where you have these small oscillations, which sometimes elicit large spikes. And in this kind of regimes, if we look inside the network, in more detail and compare with the mean field, we see different things. So this is the mean field. It's 
mostly uh, sub-threshold oscillating and from time to time emitting a spike. And this green laser is also emitting the sub-threshold oscillations and from time to time spikes synchronously. But this pink laser, it does emit the spike just like everyone else, but it does not show the sub-threshold oscillations. So they kind of do almost the same thing, but not completely. So it's not hard synchronization, we could say. But still, if we look at the bifurcation diagram of the fully connected network, so the iris is completely open and we look at the collective dynamics, we see a bifurcation diagram which looks extremely similar where we find stable fixed point at the two ends, uh, chaotic spiking here and uh, relaxation oscillation in middle uh, which some, with some random or chaotic spiking here. So we, ha we have uh, a large ensemble of spiking systems which behave in a remarkably simple way. So we can wonder where these low dimensional dynamics come from. To, yeah, to try to, to get an idea about that, uh, we model this uh, system. We start from the same model as before. It has been renormalized because it's, it was easier to, 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 to cast into this form for, uh, for the other calculations we do after that. But basically, Xi is uh, the intensity of laser I, Yi is the atomic dynamics of laser I, and uh, this W is the unique feedback current that couples all uh, lasers. And it appears here and there. The control parameters now are, now are in principle many because all lasers are different. So all the delta i's here are all the uh, distance to threshold uh, of each of the i uh, n lasers that we have in the network. So can we find uh, a mean field uh, description of this uh, system? This is, uh, as we have seen, this is a system where we have, uh, so we have n lasers, n is 450, and we have two n uh, dimensions here, plus one dimension here. So it's a very high dimensional system. Can we derive a mean field for this high dimensional system? This is a typical approach when we do in neuroscience to try to understand the collective dynamics. So we can do that. We can always define uh, a mean field by uh, defining the uh, capital X variable, which is the average value of laser intensity, and capital Y, which is the average value of population dynamics. And we define an average uh, control parameter, which is the average of, of all the distance to threshold of all the individual lasers. And the model you find for this mean field is this one. So you have a model for the mean field, but the point is that there is no way you can remove that or that. So this is typically what one hopes when one tries to derive a, a low dimensional uh, system for a mean field, is that when the limit n grows, perhaps this term will tend to zero and then you can eliminate it. And this one goes to zero, you eliminate it. And then that means that you have a very simple equation for the mean field. In this case, it does not, they do not cancel. So that means that the mean field is not an ordinary differential equation. So we can, so we are a bit puzzled at this point. So how comes we still observe these low dimensional dynamics in spite of a uh, system, the, low, the, the, mean the, the mean field remaining high dimensional equation? We'll see the origin is twofold. Half of it is deterministic and the other half is uh, stochastic. And the deterministic part is uh, essentially due to the fact that we are looking at a, a slow fast system, uh, because as we said, this uh, variable is slow as compared to all the others. So this epsilon is slow, is small. So we can look at what happens in the case n equals three which is basically the last case you can uh, a little bit visualize. Uh, it's possible to, to compute actually the critical manifold and its stability uh, by splitting the population between lasers which are off, those uh, which, are, which have Xi zero and those on which have Xi different from zero. This lives in a seven dimensional phase space and uh, the um, number of branches in the critical manifold of the whole system is composed by two to the three branches, which are parabolas and straight lines. So we see the straight lines here, parabolas here, 
And this is a zoom in this small region. So we see that the critical manifold, the critical part of the, the stable part of the critical manifold is blue. This is laser one starting uh, from zero. So laser one is on, the other two are off. And later laser two starts, only this one, and it is unstable. Here only laser three starts, it's also an unstable branch. And from these branches, you have new branches that emerge. Here, uh, laser one and two have emerged, but it's an unstable branch. But still from that one, laser three starts, and we have again an unstable branch. So actually what happens is that among all these branches, most of them are unstable, all the red ones, and the other one which are stable are the blue parts. So it's interesting because that is, uh, we know that these parts will be attractive for the dynamics of the whole system. And this is what you see when you simulate the case n equals three. Here, all lasers are in the off state, so they are on one branch of the critical manifold. Laser one starts, relaxation oscillation, and goes to, the, to its own state. Later on, we have laser two that starts. It will reach also the critical manifold. And that is an interesting point because this is supposed to be unstable. Here we have laser one and two, which are on and not laser three. And this is unstable. Still, the system goes there. Uh, and finally, laser three starts and everyone reaches the attractive branch of the critical manifold, which is here. This is a projection in phase space. When we look at large N, actually the same kind of calculations can be done, uh, although it can be a little bit, uh, yeah, it's, it's perhaps a, a bit more messy, but if you assume that uh, all lasers are similar enough that their th distance to threshold is close to the average distance to threshold plus some small variable, then you can compute the critical manifold and its stability, and you find a huge bundle of uh, 1D branch. There are two, two to the N uh, of these branches, which at order zero in the smallness parameter here closely resemble that of a single uh, device. And the stability can also be worked out. And what you find is that um, the stability is essentially the one of uh, a single laser whose distance to threshold would be the average delta parameter. And if you simulate the dynamics, this is, uh, oh, where is if you simulate the dynamics uh, of uh, 10,000 lasers, what you see is that the dynamics here is very much low dimension, is, is very much simple. Everyone converges to this branch. There is some uh, mixed mode oscillations, which will trigger a switch to here and finally jump to the other branch. So this slow part of the dynamics is uh, very much uh, synchronized for all lasers, while here this part, which is transverse to the critical manifold, is very much messy. There the lasers don't follow each other in this fast part of the dynamics. So this is what you see here if you compute the mean field, it has this chaotic dynamics. If you compute the dispersion uh, of the spiking elements, you see the dispersion is essentially zero when the dynamics is slow, and the dispersion makes a huge jump, a huge jump where the uh, dynamics is fast. And what you find is that chaos and mixed mode oscillations are actually robust, even for very, very large n. And the average distance to threshold controls the dynamics. So this is the uh, insight of theory about this system. So we can try to analyze that experimentally and uh, in particular, we want to assess the role of the average delta parameter. So to do that, we analyze three different networks, a smallish one here, the D network, which shows this bifurcation diagram and has uh, an average threshold, which is here. And if we look at the E population, which is much larger, it shows the same kind of bifurcation diagram, but it's shifted. And the average threshold of this population is actually here. And if we take the full network, it has again a slightly shifted bifurcation diagram, which is otherwise very similar. And it has also a slight shift in the population uh, average threshold current. So this can be summarized in this graph where we show uh, 
where some prescribed dynamics takes place. We take this bifurcation here, depending on uh, the uh, average threshold current of the population we consider. So this is one measurement point, this is another measurement point, this is another measurement point. So you see that the small populations, which are the small circles here, are very much dispersed in the graph. They are mostly around this line. So the origin of this line comes from the fact that the average uh, threshold uh, controls the dynamics. So this uh, straight lines is set by this equation here. But what is important is that the larger the networks, so the bigger dots, the more you see that uh, we are concentrated on this, on this straight line and the more we go onto this single region. So we see that the larger the network, the more the dynamics is controlled by the average value of this uh, delta parameter here. So from that, we can consider that we have uh, verified, let's say that we have a pretty much pretty good explanation of the uh, deterministic part of the dynamics and the experiment pretty much matches what we find uh, by looking only at this. And what we find is that the critical manif manifold rules most of the dynamics because the network converges very fast towards two 1D branches which are attractive. And the stability of these branches is that of a single average laser. Now, what about noise? Certainly there is noise in this system as much as there is noise in, in, uh, in neural systems, in biological neural networks. So we can wonder what the effect of noise is. So here, this is the experiment. We look at a periodic oscillation regime. And here we zoom on this part of the dynamics, which is supposed to be the fastest one. Uh, and what we find is that, yeah, there is a kind of synchronicity here, but the departure is not strictly at the same time. If we look at um, numerics with and without noise, this is without noise. Uh, we see the mean field starts here, one laser starts here, and the red one starts here. It does not look like what we find in the experiment. If we add plenty of noise to the numerics, then we find something which is much more similar. So it seems that noise heavily impacts the departure from the off branch of the critical manifold, which is quite expected uh, from laser physics, of course. Um, perhaps less uh, expected uh, result of, of noise is that it can actually enhance the coherence across the network. So here you have numerical simulations starting from a no noise situation to a very noisy situation. In a no noise situation, we see that, uh, as we said, we start with one laser here and then the network uh, visits this unstable uh, part of the critical manifold. So it is a, a very surprising canal trajectory. What the system is doing basically is that each time a laser leaves its off state, uh, we are going along an unstable branch of the critical manifold. So it's a part of a canal orbit then the system changes direction in phase space completely because of when other laser switches on and it goes along a new uh, unstable branch, which is attractive in many dimensions, but repulsive in just one dimension. And at some point it departs along this unstable dimension, which is where a new laser starts on. So these canal trajectories are very, very, very amazing because they are an itinerancy across all the dimensions of the phase space uh, which are driven by following unstable branches of the critical manifold. So it's, it's a very, very amazing dynamical situation. If you add some noise to that, then much less time is spent on these unstable branches, as can be expected. And there is actually an optimal noise le level here, which is uh, in which the trajectories are a little bit shaky, but they are also optimally coherent. So we can characterize that uh, by some indicator, but okay, I don't go into that. What is relevant, let's say, is that some, for some amount of noise, there is an optimal coherence across the network. So it's reminiscent of uh, resonance coherence or stochastic uh, resonance, uh, stuff like that. But here it happens across uh, a network of coupled elements and not in the course of time. Um, so, then experimentally, I think we are basically in this situation, which is very, very, very noisy. 
So we get two results from the stochastic analysis. One is that first noise cleans up canal trajectories in a high dimensional phase space. And this phenomenon we have called canal resonance. And second result, yeah, that we learn, actually we have a much better description of our experiment when we uh, add noise to this system. So that takes me to the summary of, of this, uh, of this uh, piece of work. Now what we have built is uh, one of the, there are not so many uh, photonic spiking neural networks actually. So this is one and uh, we like the fact that it's a slow fast dynamical system which therefore has a dynamical structure which is very well known in, in the field of, of neuroscience. And it's one of the few experimental works where we can observe actually a controllable dynamics of, of a large or large-ish uh, network. And uh, we have uh, find out that the effective low dimensionality uh, origin is deterministic due to the slow fast nature of the system. So it's a bit difficult to generalize that formally, but what we believe, and we have, we have some preliminary analytics, let's say, that indicate that, there is a very large class of systems, uh, which if you couple them by uh, via their slowest variable, which is what happens here, will tend to behave exactly in this way. So if you couple plenty of slow fast systems through their slowest variable, I believe they will show this kind of uh, low dimensional dynamics without synchronization of the fast dynamics. So a kind of partial synchronization, incomplete synchronization. Uh, and then we have uh, some results about stochastic effects where noise cleans out the dynamics by shortening the, the, traje the canal trajectories. So with that, I think we mostly advanced, uh, we propose a new mechanism, let's say, by which a large ensemble of spiking nodes can behave in a low dimensional way. So this is a, an interesting objective. It's a pool photonic spiking network, but it, it's not a learning network yet. So of course, this is uh, on the agenda. And it will be no surprise that uh, there are two directions we would like to explore. The first one is plasticity. So that will be about controlling the coupling coefficients. Uh, here we control them in a very manual way. It's either one to all coupling or few to all or, or all to all when we open or close the iris. But it would be uh, quite interesting to control that in a more efficient way. So either externally via a special light modulator, for instance, or perhaps through physics, which would be uh, very interesting. Uh, and also the second point, we can try to have a hierarchy of networks because, uh, yes, it's clear that there is a hierarchical uh, working in, 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 in neural networks in biology. So we can try to couple these networks together. We have a few of them and we can try to couple them and see uh, what comes some, uh, out of there. So with that, I am done. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Stefan, for your uh, extremely interesting presentation. And um, I guess we can, uh, we have enough time. Uh, we have uh, more than 10 minutes for questions, uh, the, which we can see in the in the panel, can you see them? Yes, there is a uh, Stenlo. I see, I see a question by Stenlo. Yes, I will try to first uh, read it, uh, uh, understand it, and then I read it loud. Sorry. So I am curious. I was expecting that by increasing the perturbation parameter, we should see more bifurcations as chaotic systems in general. Do you know why we don't see more bifurcations? Okay. So. Um, so by the way, the, the, the perturbation thing we have done for the single laser and for the whole network. There are some differences that we are working out right now and I think they are due to the uh, structure of the separatrix, which is a bit different in the coupled network case. But uh, basically what, what happens is that uh, there is no multi-stability of, uh, of, uh, of this model. Um, let me go back to this uh, structure. Well, so there is, there is no uh, bistability in there. The system can be either on a rest point here, or it can be on a rest point here, or it can be periodically switching there, or it can be chaotically spiking. So, which is kind of the same kind of orbit, but which is chaotic due to this point. So 
what we do for the um, for this um, analysis of the response of the system is that we start in this region so we are on a rest state and the stronger i push the system it will anyway come back here because it is the only uh, attractor of the system when in this in this parameter uh, region so this uh, now we can we can also uh, be in uh, go into a chaotic regime here and perturb the system and then we will trigger these spikes superimposed to the to the sub threshold oscillation but again there is just one attractor this is the sub threshold oscillation and the system will come back here this is kind of a hallmark of uh, neural dynamics they are well, it's not completely true, but there are some neurons that are uh, bistable, where you find a tiny range where when you perturb the system, you actually push it into an oscillatory regime. But here we concentrate on systems which do not have this multi-stability feature. We just want to have the uh, action potential emission. So that is hopefully that answers uh, the first uh, part of the question. Um, now, the second question is, if you measure, measure the ratio of perturbation parameter between the system in the attractor stage and where it becomes two bifurcations, I was thinking it would be, oh, <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, you, you are wondering about the, the, uh, the beginning of... Um, uh, of a Fale uh, tree and the Feigenbaum cascade and stuff like that, uh, where the separation between all the bifurcations would be well defined. Is that it? Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear ah, you. Okay. No, it's just because in, in the force slides, I thought I saw zero, 0 0.22 for the initial of the bifurcation and one for the resting stage. And that would be very similar to this chaotic constants that seems to appear everywhere. And it was just a curiosity. But now I can see in this slide, you are showing the current, the pumping yeah. current, and then for that one is, is not this uh, approximately ratio. Yes, so uh, this is a driving parameter that we control, which is the pumping current, but the perturbation we don't apply in this uh, parameter, actually. Ah. It's, uh, the perturbation is uh, is uh, optical. Um, the reason why we uh, so the the, the play the place where we apply the perturbations is actually here. So here, what we do is that we shine an additional laser that will perturb this part of the dynamics. And the reason we don't we do it here and not here, where we could also, but we won't. We do it here because when you are in the case where you have a laser array here then that means that we will be able to encode information here uh, or apply perturbation by putting some kind of special light modulator. So we want to study how the network will respond to perturbation in space, on the spatial profile, you know, of this, uh, of this object, on the special profile that you put here. So basically, I think this is one of the strengths of this uh, architecture. Uh, for instance, this morning, Miguel, uh, Miguel, or was it yesterday? It was yesterday, I think. No, this morning. This morning, Miguel discussed a very interesting approach where they use as a, as a reservoir for computing so complexity. They use temporal dynamics. So this is very much uh, adequate to, for example, sequence to sequence learning, which you do with recurrent neural networks. But if you want to apply that to images, then you first have to serialize your images and, and then do things, if I understand correctly. Here, because we are dealing with a special system, with a multi-element system in space, we can hope to uh, put information here that will alter the connections of the network. Okay, I understand. Thanks very much. Thank you for your uh, question. Uh, just a curiosity about, you know, is it, do you think that uh, to have this uh, uh, mimicking of the neuron, uh, you, you really need a, a slow, fast uh, optical implementation? So you need these two largely different time scales? Uh, so it's just, thinking, it, just thinking if you could uh, move uh, to a completely all optical version. Uh, for yes, the yes. So 
No, it's, I would say it's very doable. So we have worked in the past with purely optical implementations. Um, yes, and, and we are still working on some of them. So you don't need to have the slow, fast character. What is funny here with the slow, fast character is that it really mimics uh, a, a pretty realistic neuron in the sense that there are many paradigmatic models of neurons in the in the computer in the sorry mathematical neuroscience literature and some of them are not slow fast at all they are easier to handle in many cases they are easier to simulate and so on but these ones the slow fast ones are are very very much realistic because the because yeah the, the biochemistry of neurons uh, works like this <laughs> it works like this so there is a very fast flow of, uh, of, of uh, ions uh, which depolarizes a membrane and this is very fast process while the charging of the membrane is, is, is much slower. So the slow fast thing is very, very common in, in biology. Actually, yeah, it's, it's interesting to notice that the spiking, the whole spiking ID, why do we, uh, are we so attached to the spiking ID? It's because nature seemed to have settled that it's a good solution. I mean, all thinking, uh, all natural thinking devices do that through spikes. So perhaps, <laughs> I mean, I can imagine that uh, nature has good reasons to do that. So that's why we, we want to have uh, kind of realistic neurons. Yeah, that's uh, sometimes in cartoons, you see that when Mickey Mouse has an idea, there is a, uh, some bulb that flashes. So that, you know, maybe we get <laughs> ideas in spikes, not, uh, not slowly. <laughs> In the light spikes, sorry. Light spikes, yes. <laughs> okay. So thank you so much. And uh, I will keep listening to, to, to today's talk, of course. Uh, and then we talk again on, on Friday. Great. So we uh, thank you, Stefan, uh, once again. And uh, good lunch to everybody. And we'll meet again at uh, a real lunch, not virtual. <laughs> and, okay. And, uh, and uh, see, see each other at 2 p.m. Today. Okay, bye. Thanks a lot. Bye.